Hi, my name is Chris Kulmer, and welcome to the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. In this podcast, I explore the unique world of music education in the international school context. You will hear amazing stories from music teachers working at international schools all around the world. Learn tips and tricks from a global community of leading music ed experts and be inspired to develop your capacity to be truly international in your approach to music education. Well, today I'm really lucky to be speaking with Anna Gower. Um, Anna is a music education consultant, a through school music teacher, so that's early years through to year 13, um, and currently a key stage two music teacher at St. Andrews International School in Bangkok. Uh, She has a long association with Musical Futures and currently with the Musical Futures International arm of the organization. Um, And Anna and I, I I we've sort of met vaguely over the years um, during my time working in international schools and connecting through organizations like Fabicia, the Federation of British International Schools in Asia. Um, I remember learning about musical futures at a Fabicia conference. And I think I remember Anna and Ken presenting on uh, musical futures, what it is, and some of the resources. And I remember loving the resources and applying them straight away to what I was doing weekly, daily in class. Um, the resources were amazing. So I guess since this uh, podcast is is focused on international schooling and music teachers in that context, um, today we're going to explore some of the things that Anna's been working on. So thanks for joining us, Anna. How are you doing? Thanks, Chris. Really good to be chatting. I'm doing okay. Thank you. Great. And where are you at the moment? Well, I'm currently sitting in a lovely hotel in the middle of Melbourne, CBD. Where, uh, we're just coming to the end of uh, Musical Features International Workshop Tour. So I've managed to, despite COVID and lots of challenges, make it through. Uh, we've done one, two, three, four, five fantastic workshops so far across Australia and New Zealand with one to go. Um, so yeah, just looking forward to, to coming through the other side of that. And, and it's been great to meet up with music teachers who are just, you know, really enjoying having some PD again and getting together and, and connecting and catching up with old friends who, of course, I haven't seen for a very long time since the whole world closed and we haven't been able to travel and, and, and meet up with people. So this is, yeah, it must be one of the first kind of workshop sessions you've done in a long time. It is. Well, certainly face to face like this, where we're bringing teachers together um, to make, you know, to kind of learn professional development through making music together. So I think it's been the last one I did was 2020 February in Singapore as the world was shutting around me Mm. (laughs) desperately clawing my way back to get back to Thailand in time to, um, you know, enjoy the lockdowns and everything that's happened since for a couple of years. (laughs) Well, that's cool. Um, Well, we're definitely going to touch on musical futures because that's yeah such an interesting kind of concept and I'm sure lots of people will be keen to find out more. Um, but if it's okay, let's let's talk a little bit about your journey to becoming an international school music teacher, if that's okay. So could you kind of outline that a little bit? What, what was your journey to becoming an international school music teacher? Well, it was a crazy journey because this was never in any kind of a plan that I had. Um, And like so many things, pieces fall into place and things happen. And then you find yourself in situations which are just so far removed from where you ever thought you would be, which I think is really characteristic of international teaching actually, can take you on amazing journeys. Um, But I first became familiar with international teaching through my friend and colleague, Steve Jackman. So I'd worked with Steve on musical features in the UK. He then went to Malaysia. Um, And at the time I was working with musical features on training programs in the UK and Steve got in touch and said, look, you need to bring this to the international schools. You know, there's a huge appetite here for for getting together for PD. Teachers love to travel, love to come and meet together. And, and, you know, I think there's a real space here for you to bring musical features out. Um, So Steve was really instrumental in setting up our first international musical features PD in Malaysia at Alice Smith School and that was the first time I had ever been to Asia and it was the first time I had ever really been in an international school and met teachers who were who were on this journey and from there the the international program 
for Miss Futures built. So I was really, I just had the most amazing opportunities to go to so many different schools. So I've, I visited schools in Singapore and Hong Kong. We've been to China and um, the Philippines, Thailand, obviously, um, and continuing our work in schools in, in Australia and New Zealand. And I, I don't know how it happened, but I was managing to do all of this alongside my secondary school music teacher job in the UK, where yeah, I worked right. three days a week as a teacher. Um, and the remaining three days that I could manage in the week for Musical Features UK. So gradually that all came together. And, and each time my, my colleague, Ken, who I worked with, we would land in a city and we would go to a school and we'd meet the teachers and he'd say, so Anna, do you see yourself living here? And I'd go, mm, no, no. Until one day we landed in Bangkok and Steve was then working in Bangkok. I, I, I had a couple of other friends there and, and just went into the city and thought, when he asked that question, yes, actually, I, I could see myself working here. So so that was the first time that I I sort of, you know, I've, I've got three kids. My husband's a professional opera singer and work opportunities for him were drying up in the UK. Um, he was a, 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 a zero hours contract paid singing teacher. Um, and Steve Jackman phoned me one day and said, I've got a job at my school. Would your husband be interested? And I was like, no, don't be he wouldn't be interested I asked him and he said yeah all right let's have a look at it so that was kind of the first conversation that I'd had with him um and this is getting very long-winded but long story short when we went back to Thailand for our second workshop I sat at drinks with a fantastic teacher called Isabella Main and I'd spotted Izzy at the workshops um and the way that she talked about her school the way that she worked with the teachers her kind of whole ethos around music teaching I was really interested in speaking more to her and she said I've got a job going at my school I said right well I've got a husband <laughs> Stand at home, have a chat and within two weeks he'd been offered a job at Denla British School working with Izzy and we decided to make the jump and take our family out and just go for it and this was in 2019 so we moved over in August. Um, initially, when I was there, my job was going to be to roll out musical features. So I didn't I didn't go out to take a school job. I was based a bit closer to Australia and New Zealand. I was working with the international team by then. And my remit really was to look at how we could roll the program out across international schools in Asia, Middle East, Europe, and then continue developing work in New Zealand and Australia. So that was all very, you know, going fantastically well. We'd, we'd had some contracts working in China. I was like, this is great, no jet lag. You know, I can travel. My husband and my kids are very happily settling into international school life. And then COVID hit, and that was the end of that. So I realised this is extremely long-winded. <laughs> an extremely long-winded journey to get to where I am now. Um, so I realised I would be travelling for a while. I went to my husband's school, said, have you got a job? You know, do you need anybody? And they said, oh, actually, we need a year one teacher. Hmm. And I went, oh, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a secondary school music teacher, but okay, I mean, let's let's see you, you take an opportunity so I, I jumped in and, and I did a year teaching year ones mm. my own class which I just love the relationships that you form having a class compared to when you're a music teacher and you're mm. seeing so many children are really special and I learned a huge amount about how young children learn um so when I realized COVID wasn't going anywhere I was really fortunate to get offered a job at St Andrews in the primary music team there um, I knew the school through Phobosia and, and through meeting lots of teachers. So, uh, you know, I'm hugely fortunate. To, and I've just finished my first year there going into the second year when we go back. So that's my kind of very long winded journey to international wow. <laughs> teaching. Well, and here we that, are. Yeah, that's um, that's a great that's a great story, actually. And uh, yeah, I had no idea. And it's so interesting that you mentioned the year one teacher element of it. Um, cause I didn't know that. And that must be so different because as music teachers, we're so used to having all these classes coming and going and you build relationships and, you know, but it's really hard. I've often found to, to build that, that deeper sense of relationship. So that's really cool. I'm just thinking straight away though, your class would have been amazing. There would have been so much music. Yeah. In your year one yeah. class. <laughs> well, and not just, not just the music. I think it's the. I took the way that I taught music into teaching all those other things because that's what you do. And, you know, I've been a teacher for a really long time. So I've developed my own ways of doing things through music. And so I was quite surprised really that I, I could just take those same approaches and strategies and all the things that, 
that you do in music that you, you listen a lot to the children don't you and you give them mm. space and time to to put a bit more creativity into into things and just just a bit more trust i guess in them being able to work independently and to come up with their own ideas which we see them do so much in music so taking lots of that because what else was I going to do? I had no idea. Mm. <laughs> no, I'd never even, I'd watched a couple of lessons with another year one teacher and gone, wow, you're super organized. And even behavior management is different. You know, it's, 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 it's so scaffolded and, and with younger children and things like that. And I just kind of felt my way and together with the children, we, we came up with our own structures and our own routines that I brought in from music. And, and that was really interesting. And so I learned so much really about having to mesh traditional approaches with teaching younger children with what I was bringing in from music. And I've taken all of that back now into music too. So I've got a huge renewed admiration for class teachers. And I realized just how precious that PPA time is. So, you know, mm. if there's anything I can do to make sure that you know those teachers have that time while their children are with me that's that's really important making links to things like literacy and, and understanding how class teachers structure some of the way they work and putting that through some of the music projects we do and finding a balance i, I think is something that i've 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 really taken back with me mm. i think we could do a whole conversation just on that um <laughs> but i might pivot here and just going back to sort of the international school teacher journey and being in Thailand and your initial, that feeling you, you mentioned where you were like, oh, I could, I could live here. Um, can I ask you sort of what's your favorite thing about, about living in Thailand? Oh my goodness. I guess, I think it, as a family, it was the challenge. I know that sounds really weird, but we, as soon as our decision was made, so my kids are, are, are older. When we came out, my daughter was about to start A-levels. I had one child in year going into year six and one going into year eight. So, you know, that's kind of pivotal time for all of all of the kids. My, and, and once the, the, they never looked back and I was really, really proud of them for that. And my husband, he'd never been to Asia. He'd never actually I hadn't taught a classroom job for many, many years, just throwing themselves into that and then pitching up with five suitcases and just us into this boiling hot, rainy, <laughs> crazy city and we didn't even know where we'd be living so the school hadn't given us very much information you will be given accommodation that was it so you know we couldn't prepare ourselves for what we'd find and we really had to to work together and I think the fact that we didn't have any money you know it was like an absolute reset for us from the very beginning um and the kids had to settle into their schools and we had to be very flexible you know we didn't have a car I've never not had a car so what I enjoyed about it, I think, was was the challenge of making ourselves fit into this country and then getting to know the local culture and, and helping the kids. Because in my travels, I'd really started to appreciate that the cultural differences when you're working somewhere else or when you're visiting somewhere else, when you feel that strangeness that you're not quite sure what's going on, that's not where you are, that's you. Mm. And so making the adjustments by by just kind of being really respectful for what, what was happening around us and being really open to learning those new things. So I guess that's kind of a general thing, but but the specific thing for Thailand really was is just how nice everybody is. Mm. And, and it's a very easy place, you know, before we all had to wear masks, obviously there's people do smile at you. People do try to communicate and want to help. Um, and so it's it's quite a welcoming place to be. It's also completely bonkers. And, you know, you don't know from one minute to the next if you're going to make it to your appointment or if you're actually going to get to school or the traffic was great. But, you know, it, 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 it makes you adopt this kind of much more laid back attitude to life and become less stressy and less less tense about things. The food is awesome. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, the children within the schools and the families that we've been fortunate enough to work with are lovely. And in my current school, I absolutely just love the mix of, of children and families there. There are something like 51 different nationality, nationalities of kids. And it's this huge melting pot of, of, of kids from everywhere. And I really love that, that experience of working with those children, but also for my children kind of getting involved in those communities mm. and finding their own space. Does that make sense? It's yeah. Not, not a direct answer to the question, but it's more about, I think it's more about when you make the leap and you're making a commitment to be there for a certain length of time, it's not necessarily about the place. It's about the whole experience. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally hear that. Um, 
I know I've talked to lots of colleagues over the years about food. <laughs> so I like that you mentioned that. It's just like, oh, food, food in, in Thailand. And, you know, if anyone's been to, to Bangkok specifically, it's yeah. just so good. Like some of that street food. Oh, and it's Especially. everywhere. And, yeah. you know, and very quickly, this thing about, well, you know, like, well, it's probably not sensible to eat street food. Mm. You know, it might not be very clean. It goes out the window because you just... It's so much part of the culture and food is really important mm. to everybody. Um, y y you know, it kind of, it just changes your focus on things and not being able to afford or get the food that my kids were used to is really eye-opening for them. Mm. Like one of my children refused to eat anything except white rice for a really long time, lost loads of weight. And we were like, mate, you know, we're here. Better, <laughs> gonna better change to that palate that. quick. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to just jump in and because yeah. this is how it is. Um, yeah. So yeah, you know, that's been really interesting to you. And I, I, I want to start to learn to cook Thai food properly so mm. that I can take that with me because it's, it's quite a special relationship with food. Yeah, great. So um, you mentioned a couple of things about the the different nationalities in your school and um, working with, with the children and you've really loved that. I guess my next question might be a tricky one, but what do you think from your experience so far makes a good international school music teacher? Gosh, that is such a good question. I think you have to go in and be prepared to relearn a lot of stuff. I've, I've seen examples where things haven't quite worked because people have brought their UK attitudes mm. and expectations over and tried to put them into this very different scenarios and situations. And there's such a transient population, isn't there, with both students and teachers that you're quite often coming into departments that haven't been particularly long established or where teachers have moved on and you're coming in and, and thinking, well, like, what's here and what changes can I make? Sometimes we come in, don't we, with great ideas. Like, oh, my goodness, I'm going to change this up. And we're going to do the most amazing things. And actually, the realities are you probably just need to go along with what's there already whilst you get the hang of how everything works. Um, and the relationships with the children are different. Every school is different. Every class is different even just because of, of, of the mix. And I know that's normal in all teaching, but I think it's particularly so in international teaching. I found that the departments tend to be very well resourced, which is great. But sometimes you've got to think about how you use that resource in the most effective way so that you, you're getting into sufficient depth with children. There's lots of expectations around performance. So the shop window is super important in international mm. schools, isn't it? You know, making sure that there's so much that the parents can see and, and feel that they're getting value from music and finding a balance between putting on those performances with keeping the curriculum ticking over in the background so the kids that are kind of having the, the more in-depth and holistic music experiences that sit alongside that. So that's, that's kind of my general view from visiting lots of, of different mm. schools. My own personal experiences have been because I also I also worked in Bromsgrove School for a while doing cover, and that was second that was upper primary and secondary, and so I think I'm not the head of department in my school, so I think the most important thing has been just finding a fit for me and the things that I can bring within the department. And sometimes you just got to be you got to be the kind of person that can stand back and take a little bit of time and observe and listen before you you go jumping in, um, because that makes it a smoother transition for everybody. Um, I think as an international teacher, you've got to be prepared to work hard, right? You know, it's work hard, play hard mm -hmm. out, there, out there. Long hours, commuting is sometimes challenging. There's high expectations, especially in terms of the performances. You work hard and it's not an easy ride by any means. Um, holidays are fantastic. Yes, of course they are. And, you know, we are, in most countries, we're well paid so that we can live live a comfortable life but that is a balance that you know the school only for that amount of time and there is always this you know we're, we're coming up for contract renewal where do we want to go where might we be looking left, left next so you kind of have to always be thinking one step ahead of where you want to be going with with that career and how that fits in with your family and expectations and then I guess musically I think it's really important that this ties in with all of the things that musical features that, that I really believe in is you've got to leave space for the kids to bring their musical experiences and passions into the classroom as well. So if we're in a British curriculum school, yeah, we do have to deliver that British curriculum, but we're living in a, in a country which is vibrant with cultural and musical experiences. And there are children who've lived all around the world and have heard and experienced far more different kinds of music than I have. 
So leaving space for that to be able to become an important part of what happens in the music classroom, I think is really important and finding ways that you can bring you can bring that in and not just put, you know, our British curriculum expectations into, into those children. There's a balance to be found there as with everything. Yeah, that's such a great point. I'm thinking straight away about um, the whole idea of curriculum and how we can so easily sort of take the paper and think I've got to apply this. But I guess I'm, I'm also thinking about you've got all these children that have different musical experiences from potentially all over the world or multiple, they may have lived in multiple places too with multiple influences coming in. Um, do you have any examples? This might be a tricky one, but do you have any examples of how you've how you've implemented or changed, manipulated your kind of on the paper approach to curriculum and and adapted it for the international school classroom setting? Yeah, I think well, well, the first example was it was actually my head of department who said, "When we're coming up to Christmas, we're gonna we're just gonna look at festivals, and we're gonna make sure that we play lots of music from lots of different." parts of the world so was, you know around that time of year there was Diwali there was Hanukkah there is Christmas <clears throat> um there's even bonfire night mm. you know that there, there, there are lots of different festivals there and <clears throat> so I just made sure that I played lots of music to the children and really interestingly you could see a couple come to life because they recognized something that they'd heard or you know there was a kid who said oh I was just I had a picture up on the screen and some music was playing as they were coming to the classroom and it was Oh, it was, it was blossom season in Japan. Mm. So I had, you know, that picture of playing some, you know, Japanese influence music in the background. She said, oh yeah, I've heard that in, when I lived in Japan, I heard that played and I know what that instrument is. So, you know, I don't know the right questions to ask the children to get these answers, but I think it's in the music. And when they hear something that resonates with them, then they've got that connection and then they'll start to tell you. But you see previously, and this is what music is so unique. It, there's so much of it. So we don't have to use the same set works. We don't mm. have to play the same pieces. We don't have to depend on the same play alongs or just do rock and pop music. So sometimes if we just throw a few things out there, it can open lots of doors and take us on different journeys. And I do see examples of it all the time. You know, or a kid will come in and say, well, that, that reminds me of something my grandpa played. You go, oh, tell me about your grandpa. And then, you know, the, the conversations open up and, and kids also are great at, finding they, they, they've lots of them have got phones or they've got iPads. So they'll say, Oh, have you heard this piece of music? It sounds like that one, doesn't it? Or it sounds like this one, or have you heard this? And so they're, they're very adept in finding their own journeys through things and comparing things. So allowing a bit of space for that. And we can do that in international schools. We're not as tied to, you know, structured lessons or curriculum plans as much as I've been used to in the UK. So we do have that flexibility and it's how we use it to, to, to allow some of this stuff to come in that I think is really important. Nice. So let's let's kind of move on and, and I'd love to talk more. You've mentioned your philosophy of musical futures and we're getting to it, but before we got on onto to this chat today, we talked a little about the, the impact and influence of COVID lockdowns. Um, and we're not gonna talk too much about that today because we were, we were saying, well, hopefully, and it's looking likely, that um, return to classroom, return to sort of concerts, performances, that kind of model of, of music teaching that we sort of once knew um, is coming back. So I'd love to ask you the question, what are you looking forward to most next year, next academic year? Oh my goodness. I'd just like to, I'd like to be less exhausted, <laughs> which I think comes from this constant changes that kept happening you know, post COVID timetable changes or classes being out or some kids being in or something out. And this week you're gonna have to do hybrid and have you turned on your meet and if this concert's canceled, but we're gonna have to move it. You know, the constant changes, we can respond to them and we, we do our best, but it is absolutely exhausting. So I'm really looking forward to a reset where hopefully the things that we've planned are gonna be a little bit more secure in being able to go ahead so that we, we can work towards some progression, I guess, through the year. Whereas this year has been a bit like, should we try for a concert? Yeah, okay, it may or may not work. Oh, perhaps we'll have to live stream it. Can the parents, come? you know, we'll be a bit more certain in, in how that will work. And the progression thing's really important, I think, because you're taking, in primary school, you're taking these kids through really significant years, you know, so the things that they achieve from the beginning to the end of the year, 
in their in their opportunities for performance and what they experience in class having a bit more consistency i'm looking forward to that great yeah i'm sure lots of people will resonate with that <laughs> absolutely cool so let's talk musical futures um why don't we just start with maybe you can describe explain what is musical futures and and maybe then how could an international school use it sure it's a really that should be the easiest question in the world to answer shouldn't it <laughs> except it isn't because the i think the uniqueness of musical features and the reason that's still around it's nearly 20 years now since lucy's initial research kind of puts it on the the music education agenda and just um, to jump in there we're talking lucy green yes yeah, sorry so, so lucy green whose whose research became the basis for one of the models the musical features then then built on yeah. um and initially it was a pilot project in schools i was very fortunate that my school was one of them so i was able to work with lucy and she was in school all the time working with the children um and so that helped me to really understand what was behind her research and 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 she was kind of showing me examples all the time of how the children were learning and how they were responding to things in different ways that i'd never really seen before um and then it became a bit of a teacher training program to roll out the findings and a couple of you know basic resources but it was always the remit there really to be given to teachers so here you go this is what we found this is the research here's a few resources to get you started you can take that and use it in your classroom so it's always been extremely flexible and it was never specifically designed to fit one education system or one year level because it's very much an approach to how you teach music mm. and how the children learn music um and it's and, and its uniqueness really is that it asks teachers to think slightly differently about how they learn music and how they're then kind of passing that experience on through the teaching that they do with their kids so what is musical features it has and continues to be many things so musical features initially started in the uk and it was a teacher training program and then it, it kind of evolved to become different projects and expanded out just always keeping at its core lucy's kind of key principles around informal learning that grew from her research and from the pilots in schools and then it started to develop in australia and in Australia, it became a, 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 a very t a tailored government in Victoria. It was government funded teacher training and development program. So we started to work together with the UK and with Australia. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Steve came up with the suggestion of taking it into international schools. And for commercial purposes, actually, and also in response to what teachers wanted, we would find they'd come to the workshops and they'd have a great day. And we'd do lots of music making and we'd unpack the pedagogy together and we'd kind of really go on these journeys. And people go back into school and go, well, that was good, but now I'm not quite sure what I'm supposed to do with it mm. now. So the Australians started to develop resources, which was something physical that teachers could take back and use. And that was a really crucial step into actually getting some impact where teachers said, yes, I really, I know what to do. I'll take that resource. I'll do that activity. I'll do it tomorrow. And then boom, it would start to grow into these really interesting programs within different schools and different school systems. So it's now internationally, our remit still remains about teacher development, teacher training. I'm being back doing face-to-face -face workshops where teachers are together, making music together, chatting, sharing good practice, meeting each other remains absolutely central. So we've, in the International and Australia Department of Musical Features, we've always given the resources as those tools to, to get people started. In the UK, we now work entirely separately. So the UK is now a subscription model um, where you can just buy a subscription to access the resources. So there's a slightly different focus for each for each um, sort of section of, of, of uh, musical features. Mm. UK very much focuses on the resources. International and Australia, we're very much into the teacher development and pedagogy and how we can continue to kind of bring that pedagogy to life in different ways in response to the changes that are happening in schools all around us. So the international schools model, Steve and I are kind of leading on that. We both work in international schools. I'm in primary, he's in secondary. Um, we realized that the value to international teachers of coming together, of traveling, of you know, face-to-face -face workshops is really crucial. So that's where we're really looking to bring it back. But at the same time, also thinking in this new world of COVID, how we can bring some things online as well. 
So what we don't want to do is just for people to take resources and use them in their classroom because the chances are they'll miss that kind of musical featuresness that sits behind how yeah. you deliver them and how you work with your kids and how you can use them to mold and shape different objectives. So we're also developing a bit of an online program as well so that teachers can continue to access that support for the pedagogy whilst also using the resources. Hmm. And in terms of resources, I remember using the play along videos. Are they kind of like the flagship resources? And if so, like, um, are they continuing to be developed or are there other ones that people should know about too? It's really interesting. The play along is the one teachers love. They love them the most, don't it's they? so useful. It was it's just like got... everything's on a screen and you just, boom, and you can everyone just can play along. Play. You can hear what you're playing. You can, you've got something to follow. You can get the kids playing together really quickly. That's the other thing, isn't it? Because mm. kids want to play music. They don't want to be spending hours going through the theory behind the playing of the music before they're even allowed to touch their instrument and the play alongs and the whole just play program which sits behind getting them ready to be able to access those has has always been a real favorite with teachers but with the international musical features team what we really want to do is say okay so they can play now what Mm. So how can you use those play alongs as a springboard off into kind of other musical activities? And, and there has always been within musical features, this classroom workshopping element, which is where the teacher can act as a bit more of a musical leader and you, you, you create pieces of music together as a whole class. So the play alongs are great, giving the kids the skills. If you can shout, play A minor, and they can play A minor <laughs> in time with a groove, you've got the start of a fantastic workshop that could become anything. It could become a piece that teaches the kids how structure works, or it could become a songwriting project where you, you, you're writing songs together as a whole class, or it could become just a, a, a crazy workshopping of some chords, which then you play a piece of classical music and they go, we just played that and it sounds exactly the same. So, so yes, the play alongs are extremely popular, but we're now looking at how we can bridge the gap between play alongs and informal learning classroom workshopping. Yeah. So we've developed a new resource okay. called Play Now, which is all about putting the focus back on hearing and copying music, which is really central to the kind of core musical features ethos. Mm. And our current workshop tool we're doing is called Hear, Listen, Play, Create, which is inspired by another piece of research by Lucy Green. And this was all about exploring well, how do we hear and copy pieces of music? And can we truly say to kids, hey, off you go, you copy this and you'll be all right. Because actually it's not that easy and there are a few little strategies that we can put in place that help the kids to be able to hear, really hear things and then translate that into the instruments that they're playing and trying to recreate pieces of music. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of journey that we're, we're taking people on at the moment. That sounds exciting. Um, we'll definitely put some links in the show notes to musical futures to any of the resources that might be available so that people can can have a look and i think it would also be useful um maybe we won't go too deep into it now but the whole lucy green informal learning research if there's any teachers that are sort of interested in this concept but haven't really kind of looked into it um like like you're saying anna there's there's more to it right it's like the the play along videos are great but lucy green's sort of theory or philosophy it's kind of um quite fascinating in terms of reshaping your whole approach to music teaching potentially so if you're interested in going a bit deeper would you suggest um a like any particular things to read or um b maybe some links like yeah what what would people where should people go if they want to learn more about the the background to informal learning, Lucy Green, that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, obviously the her books are the place to start. So how popular musicians learn, and then the the second one, which is really where musical features came from, the, the classroom building a classroom approach to music, and also here listen play, um, which was her third kind of piece of research in this area. We've got on the musical features international website, we've got. Um, the summaries of, of quite a lot of that kind of core information about it so cool. you know people prefer not to read entire books but just come and dip in and dip out and and, if, and a few video examples threaded through there then that's also a really good place to start steve and i are doing um little 45 minute webinars called the, like introduction webinars to musical features where we, we we explore that core pedagogy but also then look at how musical features has grown and evolved um, so that people can find a bit of an entry point. So the details about those are on the Musical Features International website too. And we do find that people really do want that overview, 
to get them started so that they've got the background and they really kind of can see how what they're doing can fit in with with some of the course stuff so those are all good places to start and there's heaps of research you know you just put a search term in and it's been the you know, mus musical features and informal learning has been so widely researched around the world that there are hundreds of academic papers to look at and um findings and things to read and and it continues to remain one of one of the really you know, current things that people are looking into in different contexts. So, you know, there's there's papers from initial pilots in Australia, there's there's papers from pilots in the UK, and they're usually quite easy to find and accessible as well. We can add links to those. Nice. And so if people want to find those webinars, um, Musical Futures International, Google it, and they should be able to sort of find yeah. it. So you've got to make sure you're going to the right musical features. That's the first <laughs> thing. So it's, so the key is in the logos. So international is a circular logo and we okay. might be able to just put that. But do be a little bit careful because, you know, if you find yourself on the UK website, you'll be on the subscription you'll site. and going for subscriptions, yeah. And it's pretty hard these days to find the kind of core pedagogy on there. You, you, mm. have, to, you, know, you have to dip in a little bit. It's easy to find resources. but So it's musical features international is the one that you want so look for the circular logo and then we've just tried to to keep those pages really current and um full of information and links and and obviously you know once we get a little bit closer to knowing how we'll be able to get back to face-to-face -face workshops and and things you should be able to find under our training tab information about the webinars we're also offering a bit of a mentoring program too because we realize that teachers are quite isolated even more so now the travel is tricky and expensive and a bit scary having you know i've just done six flights and <laughs> absolutely amazed i managed to get to where i needed to be um well done <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you fingers crossed for the next few yep. um yes yeah, so so the mentoring program steve and i are working with either schools or groups of schools to um do a bit more bespoke work about musical features and how that fits into scenarios so we've just finished working with um a group of schools in China, international schools. Um, we've done a bit of work with a university in Spain who are running a, a primary music program, some schools in Australia. So so that's a bit more bespoke and, and, and that has, you know, Steve and I working with the schools to d help to devise musical features programs. But ultimately what we want is we, we want the big face-to-face -face conferences, the, the training, the PD. So, you know, watch the space for how we're we're going to start to get that back on the road, hopefully again soon. Great. I was going to ask if there's anything in the works, but sounds like it's a watch this space and. Well, we've yeah. got, we've got a big wish list, including wouldn't it be great to do conference in Bangkok? Yes. That <laughs> but so we're just cool. going to, I think, I think we've got a few crunch points to get through the back to school for the international schools, see how everything settles and then, you know, maybe take the leap and, and see where we, where we end up that. Exciting. One other one on musical futures I saw, was it, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this in my Aussie-ness, but Mufu chat. Yes. Um, is that active and how do people access that? It is. So Mufu chat's got this, such a fascinating history because um, back in 2012, 2013, we did a pilot um, for a vocal project and 200 teachers across the world applied to be involved in this pilot. Wow. We could only take something like 10 schools. So we just had this mad idea that what if we filmed the training and we just put it out there and any teacher who wanted to could watch that training session, get involved in the pilot. And we would gather together on Twitter once a week and talk about it. And in those days, Twitter was a great sharing space for, for teachers. And there were lots of music teachers quite interested in that. So every Wednesday we'd come together and go, right. Okay. What did you do this week? And people started sharing this, you know, half formed little videos of what they'd done in their lessons. And we were watching it going, wow look at it in canada oh my goodness look these aussie schools are doing this and it sounds different to ours and how can we you know bring those examples together and give them to our teachers so we had this formal pilot running alongside this really big you know we called it a co-pilot <laughs> yeah and and the community of practice and Mufu chat grew from that so we called those wednesday meets Mufu chats and for a long time we continued to have those on twitter every wednesday night um and we would talk about different music ed topics not necessarily musical features but of course over time twitter became less of a, a friendly space to be hosting those so we were trying to find you know where the teachers are going if they're not on twitter anymore where are they um and so we created the musical features chat facebook group mm. and we ran for a couple of years fantastic teacher in queensland kelly green 
coordinated the chats for us and our weekly chats became on Facebook and they were written. So we'd have these ridiculous, like we'd put up a question and people would be writing all these answers and you know getting very muddled up, but they were great because they lived on. So you can go into the musical features chat group and you can see the archive chats going back across you know four years and alongside that whole bank of resources grew up and then people didn't want to be on facebook anymore because if you're <laughs> constantly teaching online the last thing you want to do is have a chat or go on any social media at all so recently steve and i have just brought me food chat back and now it's a real chat a bit like this chris <laughs> so oh. we're using twitter spaces um, and Twitter Spaces, if you haven't used it, is a great resource where you can just listen in or you can actually request to speak. Um, and so we've, we've run a few of those and we've we've had lots of old friends popping up there, getting joining in with the conversation and actually being able to hear each other's voices and talk. So we're going to continue to develop those and we're, we're just running the monthly at the moment to see how it goes. Um, so all the information about that can be found in the Musical Features chat facebook group so if you come on in there that's really where our main community of teachers we also have um, a facebook group musical features international for teachers in international schools so from all the workshops we've always invited our international school teachers into that one together and of course there are other facebook groups which are around there for music international teachers yeah so they're great communities to be part of and yeah that's great. That's so good. And I think that I've, I have uh, jumped in on a couple of Twitter spaces things and it, it is really cool. I like the format. Um, yeah. So hopefully that keeps going because I think we might have some people keen to join in. Well, that would be great. Well, I think watch the space for yeah. end of August, September, we'll do our next one when everyone's back from their holidays and, you know, start yeah. talking about what people are thinking of to do for the year ahead. And it's great because it's very informal. So, yeah. you know, there's no pressure to have anything prepared. You can just literally talk about your day if you want yeah. <laughs> whatever nice. cool well um that was so fascinating so much important and interesting information about musical futures i think there's lots there for people to kind of take and and explore further um excited to hear and i'll be looking out to, to see when those first workshops happen again face to face in the international school kind of context um but yeah, as I said earlier, we'll try and link lots of stuff in the show notes so people can click away and find their way to these different things we've been talking about. Um, and I hope we've got a little bit more time. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Awesome. Um, as I was sort of looking into your, a little bit more about you, which again, I just used Twitter and sort of just looked at your, <laughs> your profile on Twitter. But we have this sort of, I guess shared interest maybe um and anyone who knows me knows that i like to do a few miles um i call them kilometers of course but they are they're of course also miles kilometers is just you get more of them the more you know it's you get your kilometers quicker um so i noticed and i've seen your posts about the nhs 1000 can you tell us a bit more about what that is and what it means to you yeah this is such an interesting story so way back when we were kind of coordinating our Twitter community, my next door neighbor, she works um, in the NHS and we had a chat and I said, oh, Twitter's great. You should have a look at it because part of her job was about bringing communities of practice together around various aspects of nursing and, um, and in the medical profession. And within about, goodness me, six months, she had 12,000 followers. I was like, Kathy, you're really, really good at this. And she is just fantastic at, at, at kind of at bringing people together around all these different things. And a couple of years ago, she started this initiative called the NHS 1000 Miles, where she said, look, for, the, for this year, you're going to pledge to do 1000 miles. You can run, swim, walk, cycle, hop, you know, whatever it is you want to do, but just tally up your miles and let's see if we can get to 1000 miles by the end of the year. And so I thought, yeah, okay, let's join. And this, I think it must be now in its third year and the community is huge. And what people do is every Sunday at 7.30, they post their weekly tally of miles with a few photographs of where they've walked or cycled. And, and it's just a really motivational thing about getting people out and moving and, and you know, doing a bit more physical activity, but also about exploring the local areas where we live. So I jump on there every now and again with my pictures of Thailand, if <laughs> people assume I'm on holiday, I think. Um, but I love it because what it does is it just 
it's another community, isn't it? It's another community mm. of people who are interested in things and just making that little bit of a commitment in our busy lives to get out and do some exercise or do something that's really good for our well-being and good for and good for us. So I really recommend, and I think if more people did it from around the world, people people would you know really appreciate seeing the photographs of all the the great places that there are to walk and cycle and swim and you know just be out in the fresh air. Absolutely. And I guess for those who are listening might be like, why are we talking about, you know, miles and kilometers and, and exercise on a on a podcast that's about teaching music in international schools? But I think you've touched on something there about kind of well-being and uh, the value of exercise, but also the value of adventure. Because like you said, these photos of where you are in your, your host country or the country you're working in um, really give you a sense of connection to place and for people to, to see into that. And I definitely found that in my time, uh, especially in Malaysia where I was running in, in the jungle or whatever and taking photos and um, more than just the taking photos, it was like you said, the community and the exercise and the well-being. And um, maybe you could speak a little bit more to, to that. Have Have you found that getting out NHS 1000 miles has helped you in your in your work in your connection to community in your connection to Thailand as a music teacher in an international school that's such a great question yeah of course because if you know if you're going to make yourself go out and you're going to walk for an hour to get your miles up you're going to find and explore places that you you wouldn't find and of course you know walking on foot in a city like Bangkok is is an adventure in itself whether yep. you can actually get from a to b it's, it's really exciting but you know what we're quite we're quite isolated aren't we so you know you've left your family you've left your home base you've left places that you've lived for many years and you're coming out you know to to new places and what what i found through that community is that you know i'm i'm, I'm meeting people and looking at their pictures that makes me think that there's people around the world doing the same things and in terms of of well-being like like i said earlier you know you work hard in mm. international schools and it's tempting you go home open a bottle of wine sit there and then go again the next day so having the incentive actually just to get out and explore the places around you sometimes you do need that incentive just to push you just that little bit harder to do it and of course the, the idea about sharing photos you know i used to look at photographs of people who were living overseas and it was like fairyland you go well <laughs> you know you you live in paradise and that's all right for you but you know i try and include really everyday things mm. i've got two dogs and i walk the dogs in the local area this is this is what local life is like here or you might see a you know fantastic food stall on the side of the road and just think oh yeah this is so thailand or a tuk tuk you know something which just kind of you're absolutely right it is about place and it's about pinning what you're doing and, and that sense of identity in the place where you are and whilst having a job really does help you feel like you're fitting in there is always the sense that as expats we are sitting a level away from you know from the realities of where we live and you can make choices to live in more local areas you can learn the language you can try and get us you know closer to the local cultures but really the nature of what we do the nature of our jobs how transient it can be sometimes sometimes you do really need grounding in where where you actually are and i just like to say one more thing about well-being too yeah. is that you know we're musicians right so we could just go out to these places become very isolated not touch our instruments but particularly in bangkok there's such a great music scene there and lots of the teachers in international schools play together in bands um, there's a great network of music teachers who meet each month. So, you know, in in these different areas and different cities, it is possible to build these communities and then find like-minded people to go and do things outside of school, go and hear music, go to gigs. And we're after COVID, we're finding our way through those again, aren't we? Yeah. You know, and, and it is starting to happen again. So becoming part of the music scene and, and going and finding an orchestra to play in or going and, and playing music with some other people, that is such a great and really important part of well-being because mm. first and foremost i think we're musicians and we need that social interaction through music with other people that is such a great point yeah thanks for sharing that so nice well thanks so much for for sharing your journey into into international school teaching um all the information about musical futures and some of these kind of deeper concepts that again we could probably spend hours talking about that you know that we've just touched on about um, 
connecting and sense of place and connecting to local musical communities such great and important ideas so yeah thanks for sharing all of that um so I think we'll kind of head towards wrapping it up, but I guess, is there anything else that you, you would like to share or maybe like a piece of advice? Um, I think you've covered lots already, but piece of advice for someone that's maybe interested in working as a music teacher in an international school. Yeah, I think my advice would be if it's on the edge of your mind, explore it because, you know, it can, it can feel completely like another world, something that you would never be able to do, but actually the closer you get and finding out more information, the more it pulls you. Um, and it is just such a great opportunity and a great adventure. My main piece of advice, I think, is to, to think really carefully about where you want to be. You know, if you have a family that you're traveling with, you need to make sure that the place you are suits your family and the ages of your kids. It's a great opportunity for your children to have international school education, but you do need to be you know, a little bit informed about that. And there are lots of us in the international scene and the work, Chris, that you've been doing in bringing teachers together to share information. That's so, so useful because we can ask questions of each other about schools, about locations, about what does work and maybe what bad experiences people have had, which are as valuable to hear about as others. And every international school is different. Mm. Um, so the more you can find out about what you're going into and the more that you can experience and explore you know, what the music's like, what the culture of the school's like, what the package they offer is like, what the location is like. But once you've done all of that, if it's still niggling at you, then, you know, my best piece of advice is just give it a go. It doesn't have to be forever. You know, the contracts are short term enough. You don't have to, you know, finish your life in one place to move on to another. You can keep doors open. And the journeys that it takes you on and, and the opportunities that are out there in international education are absolutely huge and really well worth jumping into if it's something that you want to do so good and if anyone wants to get in touch with you specifically what's the best way um twitter anything really or, or email i'm happy to share my email um Great. In some of the the post feedback i'm in lots of the facebook groups so if there are people you know i'll posting questions i'll try to respond to those especially if they're specific to thailand and people quite often approach me directly because I've posted lots from all the different international schools that I've been lucky enough to visit. So, you know, I, I sort of know a little bit about, about some of the situations or I, I've, I've made connections with teachers through the workshops that mm. I can refer people on to. So, you know, if people have a question about Malaysia, I know who, who might be good to ask about that. So yeah, you know, there's lots of different ways to get in touch. I'm here. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so it's Twitter obviously, and you've got a website. Um, so they yes. can even, yeah. Google you and, and find your website. Yeah. Um, we didn't talk about some of that. Anna, Gower, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's anagawa.com. Yes, that's right. Okay, cool. So we'll put that in the show notes. Um, but Anna, thanks so much again, just for taking the time in your schedule, touring around Australia at the moment. Um, it's your holidays as well after a crazy year. Um, I hope you get some time just to relax and chill after this sort of musical futures tour finishes thank you thank you for sharing all your wisdom and your experience from your sort of background with musical futures and the whole philosophy and pedagogy all the way to now what you've been experiencing as an international school music teacher um, i really appreciate it and i i know lots of people that listening that will be listening will also appreciate it so thanks so much oh chris thanks so much for inviting me it's really lovely to have a chat and <laughs> just to you know, connects with other people. So thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Music Teachers in International Schools podcast. Listen to other episodes by visiting mtiis.com or learn more about our community on Facebook by simply searching for Music Teachers in International Schools. If you know someone who you think I should get on the podcast, I'd love to hear from you. You can find me at chriskulma.com, C-H-R-I-S-K-O-E-L-M-A.com. See you next time.